Heaven there is to it, forget it. My Lord. But I'm thankful there is a promise of a better day, a promise of a greater future. So good to have you with us again uh, here at Harvest Church tonight. And I didn't say anything by name this morning, but um, you've been coming so much. I just really, I'm kind of getting where I'm used to you being here and not, and that's not a bad thing. But uh, Shay, it's so good to have you coming. And I know Caleb uh, from many, many years as uh, we grew up in the youth group together. It's also good to see Kristen back with us tonight and also a friend Jacob. Good to have you with us and uh, appreciate you being here in the house of the Lord. One thing I forgot in the announcements portion, if you will to stand together, we're going to go to the word of the Lord in just a moment. But the snacks need to be brought tomorrow. Now, if you uh, don't have a key because of the rain, we're asking that you bring that after work between 5 and 7. Uh, we're going to be here at the building from 5 to 7 p.m. making sure that you can get in because it's supposed to be storming tomorrow. So we don't need anything left outside. So we're going to have the front doors open. You can bring your stuff in, and uh, we'll make sure it goes where it needs to go. Thank you again for your great response to that. Most everything was, was spoken for, and that is a great thing and I appreciate that and some couldn't go shopping and donated money today to that and I appreciate that also Jonah chapter 1 Jonah chapter 1 <clears throat> now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai saying arise go to Nineveh that great city and cry against it for their wickedness is come up before me but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish and so he paid the fare thereof, went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. My original intention with this message was to preach to us as Harvest Church about how that we can get so caught up in the details we miss the whole point of the story. I even planned to do that as of about an hour ago until the Lord began to rework me and that's why I apologize I was a little late to your service tonight. I was going to talk about how that, you know, we get so caught up, was it a whale, was it a big fish, what does it matter, it swallowed Jonah. And we, and we get so caught up in the details and we get, we miss the whole point of the story is not Jonah. The whole point of the story was some lost souls that were sitting in Nineveh that needed God. And while Jonah, who's the representative of God, was focused on Nineveh's sin, God was focused upon their hunger. What is pushing our world today to be ungodly and pursue the things that it's pursuing? They're hungry, but they don't know what they need. Can I just say this tonight without being misunderstood? Sin is sin. And I'm not going to name a bunch of sin tonight, but I am going to tell you that when sinners come, I hope you can catch the heartbeat of this pastor. So I told the Lord, I said, if you'll give me five minutes, I'm going to preach the message. But I do feel that this is also needed for us. When sinners come, let's not point to the sin, but let's point to the Savior. Because in so doing, when a sinner comes in contact with Jesus, he comes in contact with a Jesus that forgives the sin. And provide salvation. Let's not be Jonah's and say, well, they don't even deserve it. Who are we to be God and tell them whether they deserve it or not? My Bible says, whosoever will, let him come and take. If they need the Holy Ghost, they need the Holy Ghost. This thing's not just for Jews, it's for the Gentiles. This thing's not just for those that are trying to live right, but it's also for the prostitute. I said I wasn't going to start naming sins. It's for the worst of sins that are mine. But God doesn't categorize sin. He says lying's just as bad as witchcraft. So what I'm telling us tonight is there's a whole bunch of lost souls that need a Savior. And they're looking to us to take it to them. All right. Here's what I'm going to preach to you tonight. The great, I'm going to get back up here to my notes, the great refusal. 
We're going to look at the story of Jonah in a different light tonight. The great refusal. Would you help me pray? Lord Jesus, thank you for your presence that's in this house. Thank you for every person that's in this room. That's all right. Lift your voice. Let's pray together. Lord, help us in this building to hear from you. Lord, we're asking for your voice to be so clear in this message that we're not focused upon who's preaching. We're not focused on who's sitting next to us. We need a divine move of the Holy Ghost in our midst. Let your power fill this place, manifesting its glory. Show yourself strong and mighty, we pray. And Lord, whatever's done, we give you all glory, honor, and praise in advance. In Jesus' name, somebody shout amen and give the Lord praise of this house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Tell somebody around you, say, I'm going to help him preach tonight. Praise God. You can be seated. God bless you. Thank you for standing. So good to have you with us in the presence of the Lord. There is doubtless uh, not another book in the literature of the world that has suffered more at the hands of men than the book of Jonah. It has been tortured by its enemies. It has been wounded in the house of its friends. We have been so prone to give our attention to the non-essentials in this book rather than the essential. We have had keen eyes for the seemingly ridiculous and the bizarre. And for this reason, it has come to pass that I can hardly, and we can hardly mention the name Jonah without really a smile coming across a few faces. Because really, Jonah coming to us as an evangelist kind of makes us chuckle. He's mistaken by many to be a clown who made a wrong choice. And now, this is a calamity. It is a calamity in the first place because the book of Jonah is one of the gems of literature. There's not another book in the Old Testament that is more filled with inspiration than Jonah. There is not another book more radiant with the light of the divine love of God. And so it is a wonderful gospel in itself. Therefore, it is a great pity for us that we have turned from its winsome wealth, if you will, to give ourselves to the unedifying task of measuring the size of a fish's throat. Did you ever hear of the hungry men that were invited to a feast when they came within the banquet hall? They found the table that was spread with the extravagance of a king. But the table was a bit out of the ordinary. Therefore, there arose a discussion over the material out of which it was made. These guests began heated arguments also over the method of the carpentry, and they argued so long that the food went completely to waste in front of them, and they went away hungrier than when they walked in. There's also a story of a prince who loved a beautiful peasant girl. In spite of his royal blood, he determined, I'm going to marry that girl. And so to seal his pledge of marriage, he sends her a wonderful engagement ring. It was a gem so marvelous that it was said the stars would shut their eyes in its presence, and even the sun acknowledged It had a rival. But the girl was more interested in the beautiful box in which it was packaged than the ring. And when the prince came, he was humiliated and disappointed to find she's wearing the box on her finger rather than the ring. Now, I said that to say this. The book of Jonah is a real gem, and if we're not careful, we miss it. Can we forget the wrappings in which the gem came? The word of the Lord, our text said, came unto Jonah. The son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for its wickedness is come up before me. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah. There is nothing crude about that statement. There is nothing in that to excite our ridicule. That is one of the blessed and most thrilling truths of the ages. That to this man named Jonah, living sometime, somewhere, God would speak to him. And to this man, God made known his will and his purpose. And I want to stop right here and say this to somebody. That God is still speaking today. That the word of God is coming to men and women even as I speak right now. That there is not a single soul listening to me in this building but what at some time in your life there has come a definite and sure word from the Lord. You have felt the impression of God's spirit upon your own spirit. You have felt the touch of God's hand upon yours. You have seen his finger pointing to the road in which you should walk and the task that you are to perform. I'm thankful 
Bible Harvest Church that God is not quiet in our day today. For if we need direction, we have a counselor we can hear from. If we need peace, God can speak peace to your troubled heart. If you need a word from the Lord, you've come to the right place because God is still speaking today. How this word came to Jonah, we do not know. Nor do we need to know. It may have come to him through the consciousness of another's need. It may have come to him through a study of the word. It may have come to him through the call of a friend. How it came is not the important thing. Don't get wrapped up in the wrappings that you forget the gem. The one thing that is essential and fundamental is this. That the word found its way to Jonah. And that is the essential thing in your case and in mine. That we don't get so wrapped up in life that we miss that God still speaks to us. That God does move upon us. That God does call us or command us to do things. God does stir us up for the word of the Lord came unto Jonah and it comes still today to you and I. So we have to settle the fact that God is still speaking. If you understand that, somebody say amen. Amen. So what was it that the Lord said? He gave him a strange and unwelcome command. And we're going to stay in those three verses all night long, Sister Casey. He said, He said, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for its wickedness has come up for before me. It was hard for Jonah to believe that he had heard right. Was it possible that Nineveh was a great city in spite of the fact that it was a heathen city? Was it possible since Nineveh grieved God because of its wickedness? Could it be possible that God still loved Nineveh even though it was outside of the covenant? Jonah did not want to believe this, but he had to believe it. He had to realize it. Jonah did not want to undertake this mission. His objection, however, did not grow out of his fear that Nineveh would refuse his message and not repent. His reluctance was not born out of a conviction that there was nothing in the people of Nineveh to which his message would appeal. No, I know that we are often hampered by that conviction and we feel that it is absolutely sometimes we think it is useless for us to try and Christianize certain folk. And you say, Oh, no, we don't. What if I told you that God was sending somebody to Iran to be a missionary? Some of you would sit there and go, well, there ain't no use. There's no use in even trying to Christianize my next door neighbor. They stay up all night. They party all night. They don't care about going to church on Sunday. There's no need for me. Oh, wait a minute. We so often forget that there is in every man an insatiable hunger and an unquenchable thirst that nothing And no one but Jesus Christ can satisfy. But to Jonah, this call is unwelcome because he was actually afraid they would listen to what he was preaching and repent. And that he did not want Nineveh to do that. And Jonah believed that God was the God of Israel only. Can I explain this to you? He believed that God blessed Israel in two ways. First, he blessed her by giving to her spiritual and temporal gifts. And he blessed her in the second place by causing everybody else, their enemies, to have calamity. An abundant harvest in Israel was a blessing from the Lord. A famine in Nineveh, in his mind, was also a blessing from the Lord. So Jonah is firmly convinced that the prosperity of a nation other than his own meant calamity to Israel. It is a pity that this selfish desire did not die when Jonah died. But when we face the facts, we know that the spirit of Jonah is still in our world today. It is a very human trait in us to feel like another's advancement is in some way a blow to us. Well, what did they do to get the pay raise? It's equally a human trait to feel like somebody's downfall can add a little luster to your own crown. Well, you're going to get quiet, but I know it's right. 
Of course, nothing could really be more contrary or false. But in spite of this, we cling to the faith of this throughout all the passing centuries. And so this duty then that God has put upon Jonah, it was so distasteful that he makes up his mind that whatever it costs me, I'm not going to do it. Can you believe a mankind, uh, one of us would be stubborn? Now, I know we're not stubborn in this room tonight, but there was a man in the Bible that said, I don't care what it costs me. I'm going to not obey. And we read that he rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Ordered to Nineveh, he sets out for Tarshish. There are two cities on his map and only two. There's Nineveh, the city to which he might go and do the will of God and fellowship actually with God in the process within the circle of the will of God. There was also a Tarshish, the city that lay at the end of a rebel's road, a city whose streets, if he ever walked on them at all, would he would walk without the fellowship of God that he had disobeyed. And there are just two cities on our maps. And this is what I want to preach for a moment. The Nineveh of obedience and the Tarshish of disobedience. Can I tell you tonight, you're going to one of two places. You're going to Nineveh or you're going to Tarshish. I don't claim to know where your Nineveh is, but there is a Nineveh that God is calling you to. There is a ministry that he wants you to be a part of. There is a place that God wants to use you, but it's up to you to put yourself in position. And you got to step out from where you are and go to where God's called you. On the other hand, you may go to Tarshish. Tarshish is the city of have it your own way it's the city of do as you please it's the city of let's take it easy it's the city that has no garden called Gethsemane without its gates it's the city that has no rugged hill called Calvary overlooking its walls it is a city without a cross and it is a city where people seldomly sing and they often cry it is a city where nobody looks happy into the face of God and calls him father it is a miserable place to be out of the will of God that's why there's some they can't smile today because they're not happy why because they're out of the will of God I've come to stand in between you and your Tarshish tonight and to declare it's time for you to get involved in Nineveh there are souls that are waiting on you there are souls that need your there are souls that are at stake if you obey only somebody at the boat dock could stand here and talk to us tonight. They would say Jonah looked like he had passed through a sickness like none other. His cheeks were hollow. His eyes red from the sleeplessness. He had a worn look about him. Are you on the way home, Jonah? He would shake his head. No, I'm going to Tarshish. Tarshish was the most far away place for which the Jew could have any conception. And He said, Tarshish, what are you going to do over there? Oh, I hadn't thought about that yet. I don't know what the future's got in store for me, sir. What I'm doing is just getting away from God. And Jonah gets up to flee unto Tarshish. The Bible said it in our text. From the presence. I wonder why the text didn't say he went to flee from the presence of his duty. But instead, it says he fled from the presence of the Lord. The writer of this story had real spiritual insight. He was far clearer in his thinking than many of us. He knew that to flee from our duty is to flee from our God. Well, that went over good. Whatever you make up your mind to refuse to go, wherever it is, whenever it is, where God wants you to go and do what God wants you to do, you have to make up your mind at the same time, I'm going to renounce my friendship with God. If I walk out of His will, I'm severing my connection at the moment. You cannot walk with Him and at the same time be in rebellion against Him. Hear me, God has no way of entering into a fellowship with a soul that is disobedient to his will. Believe me, it's absolutely useless. It is mere mockery to say, Lord, Lord, and then refuse to do what he commands us to do. Now, now listen. When Jonah saw the spaces of water growing wider between him and the shore, 
a calm comes upon him. The storm don't hit as soon as he walks on the boat. They get out there a little ways. And a calm comes over John and says, you just stepped out of your Bible. No, I didn't. Hold on. A man with his mind made up to do wrong is far more at rest than a man who has no mind made up at all. When Jonah had fully decided, I'm rebelling against God, I'm leaving from the presence of God, I'm going the opposite direction, I'm giving up all claim to God, there's a rest that came to his troubled spirit. That's why it is dangerous to go by how you feel. The days before had been troubled days for Jonah. The nights had been restless nights. But the battle's over now, even though it had been lost. Uh, and, and he was at last, now he says, I can get some sleep. And this period marks, I'm sure, the period of great danger in the life of Jonah. Jonah, you see, he had been a rebel before, but he had been a restless rebel. He had been disobedient before, but his disobedience had first tortured him. It had put gray strands in his hair and wrinkles upon his brow. But now he's not only in rebellion, he's content to be so. He's not only without God, but he is in a measure satisfied to be without him. No greater danger can come to anyone than what I'm talking about right now. As long as your sin breaks your heart, as long as your disobedience makes you lie awake at night and you wet your pillow with tears, there is hope for you. Quit sitting there saying there's something wrong with me because every time I lay down I cry. No, no, no. When you become content in your sin, that's when the problem begins. Now I'm fully convinced that Jonah's danger is the danger of many both in the church and out of the church. You who are listening to me at this moment, you are kind and you are well-intentioned. You are full of goodwill toward the church. You love it and you desire its prosperity. I've heard nobody say they don't want this church to grow. You want the church to grow. Yet there are many of us doing practically nothing to make it happen. And we're content to sleep while we wait on a storm to hit us. I'm preaching in the Holy Ghost right now. There's a storm that will rock this church. And we will lose stuff that we shouldn't have to lose. If we don't wake up. One of the most discouraging features about the church world in general today. Is the large number of people happy to enjoy the benefits of church. Without getting involved. They seem to feel like it's God's best for them. That that's all God expects. He saved me. He's happy. What does discipleship cost you? What's involved in your allegiance to God? Coming to church once or twice on Sunday every week and making a contribution? Only this and nothing more. The Sunday school is not my burden. Oh, prayer meeting is not my burden. New members that recently come to church, I don't have to go visit them. That's not my burden. Hello. Well, I'm helping you. I'm showing up to church. And, and, and you know what? I, I, you know what? Hey, hold on a minute. I'm going to show up, but don't expect me to help the spiritual charge in a service and worship. I'm here. I've done my part. Yours is, you think, to make your way up to the doors of the house of many mansions by and by without ever having one single sacrifice that cost you anything. What I'm preaching tonight about is there are some of us that are running away from our sense of duty. You know what it is? I may not. At least some of you may know it. And I'm going to tell you tonight, this is a needy world. And you may not like this statement, but I'm going to tell you something. This is a needy church. God needs you in the church. Being a part of the church is an opportunity to touch the uttermost parts of the earth, even if it's spiritually, if, as long as it's spiritually alive and spiritually mighty. Are you making your contribution? That's my question. Now, let's go back to the story. Jonah turns his back on his duty, turns his back on his God, and he took ship for Tarshish and fell asleep. Surely his situation is critical indeed. But though he has forgotten God, God in his mercy has not forgotten him. You see, even though Jonah's turned his back on him and he's asleep and he's content, 
God's not sleeping and God's not happy and God's not content. And so in mercy, God sends a storm. There was dangerous cargo that the ship had on board. It would have been better, Brother Justin, for them to have had gasoline and TNT than to have a rebellious prophet. They had dangerous cargo on board. A man running from God. It was in his mercy, I said, that the Lord sent the storm. Coverdale translates it this way in the Coverdale Bible. The Lord hurled a storm into the sea. Oh, thank God. God for the storms that wake us up and that keep us from sleeping our way into the pits of hell. I would rather the Lord send me any kind of storm than to allow me to fling myself away from his presence. I'm so glad that God never allows a man to get comfortably and peacefully going into eternal death. He never allows me to be lost until he's done his best to save me. How many times does God have to reach for us? How many times does God have to grant us mercy for us to really take hold and say God I'll do what you've asked me to do I read some years ago I have a file I don't know if you do this brother Cannon but I have a file that when I read something that I think later on may preach pretty good I'll put it in a little file and uh, I have a file, and I found this story the other day, and I'd read it years ago, and it was a New England farmer that was driving to town on a cold winter's day. He overtook a woman on the way who was walking and carrying a baby in her arms, and so this was back in the day, a horse and buggy now. He pulls her up into the buggy beside him, notices there's something in her arms. It's a baby. So he puts her up in the, in the buggy with him. The cold just keeps getting bitter and, and more and more bitter. And he notices after a while he's talking, but the lady ain't talking back. And she has went to sleep. And he knew unless she woke up and kept that blood flowing good in her body, she would literally freeze to death sitting in his buggy. And so he did what at first would seem like a cruel thing. He jumps out of the wagon. He drags her back out into the snow and he grabs her child out of her arms. And with the child, Sister Shayla, he runs and he jumps back in the buggy and he says, all right, boys, let's go. You just left a lady laying in the cold. Yeah, but he's got her baby. And the motherly instinct kicks in. I can feel the looks from every mother in the room. You do the same thing. He's got my baby. He just was trying to help me to get my baby. And he's brought me out here to leave me. And so when all this starts coming to her mind, she gets up and she begins to stumble toward the wagon and, and, and dragging out of the snow. And, and all of a sudden, he notices behind her, she's kind of picked up her pace and she's getting a little closer. And next thing you know, she's just in an all-out run. When he find, he just keeps his distance till he finally makes it to his house where there's a, a fire that his wife has still running and there's warmth that was there and a temporal loss became a blessing to this woman because he refused to let her fall to sleep. I said that to say this, we ought to thank God for anything that we have to lose that will keep us from falling asleep and losing our soul. I'm preaching to somebody in this building. We gotta wake up for God's trying to save us. God's trying to make sure I don't end up on the wrong side of eternity. There's a storm. And could it be that storm is sent by God himself? I hurry tonight. Jonah, he's down in the sides of this boat asleep somewhere. Meanwhile, the tempest is raging out there. Meanwhile, there's a fear-filled crew rubbing elbows with death outside. And then a hand grabs Jonah's shoulder and he starts getting this vigorous shaking and a voice calling to him and though it's a heathen voice it's full of rebuke what meanest thou O sleeper <laughs> how is it you could sleep with all this agony going on how can you sleep with all the danger that's around us when the situation is as it is? How is it that you're not on your knees? You need, I don't know who you serve. I don't know what God you serve. How is it you're not on your knees somewhere calling out to your God? And this is what I prayed tonight would happen. That some of us that are sleeping so soundly and peacefully that God would shake us. 
that God would speak somehow through my voice to my heart and your heart and say to us, why are we asleep? What do we mean by sitting idly by in the house of God week after week and never doing anything? What do we mean by having children growing up around us but not being interested in their spiritual welfare? To even have a family altar. How can we sleep with the tremendous issues of moral life and moral death that are surrounding us as a nation? That we can be so complacent and undisturbed as they are at the cemetery in downtown Humboldt right now. Why in the name of all things holy will we continue to lie like huge stones across the mouth of a sepulcher where God's trying to raise some Lazarus from the dead. It's time for us to get up and say, I'm going to be different starting today. I'm not going to keep running from God. I'm going to call upon God. This nation needs church people who will stand up and cry out to God. I understand you need to write a letter to your senator, but I hope to God you've went to your prayer room first. I believe in voting and you'll hear it from this pulpit. You better go out and vote. But before you vote in the ballot box, you better vote in the prayer room. That shake, that message that got Jonah awake, he rushes to the deck. And the sight that met him there made a new man out of him. Now, I know he still had to go through the belly of a whale. But what he saw would change a provincial Jew into a world citizen and a missionary. What did he realize as he looks into the weary faces of those death-threatened men around him? He forgot all about them being heathen. He only remembered, if this boat goes down right now, we all drown. We're one. Everybody say, we're one. They were all threatened with death. They all needed somebody to save them. And men and women, that is still true of us today. We may differ in many respects, but we are all alike in this. We have all sinned, and we all still need a Savior. He not only saw that they were one in their needs or had the same needs, but he said we're also one in our hopes. He realized what we have been so long in realizing, and that is the oneness of the race. He came to know that even in that distant day, that since we are one body, one member cannot suffer without all the members suffering with it. He faced the fact that his own wickedness and his own wicked rebellion against God had not only brought wretchedness upon himself, but that it was bringing it upon everybody that that was sailing with him. No man ever runs from duty without hurting people he never intended to hurt. He was not only causing a storm for himself, but to others as well. If you don't remember anything else, I hope every person in this room hears me right now. If my disobedience hurts, my obedience helps. If my sin carries a curse, then my righteousness brings a blessing. Here's another vessel labeled by, lashed by a tempest. But the preacher on board this time is on good terms with God. Look at this. He puts one hand in the hand of the Lord, and with the other he saves the whole company of 276 souls that sail with him. He said, be of good cheer. There will be no loss of any man's life among us, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, fear not, Paul. You got to be brought before Caesar. And lo, God has given all of them that sail with you. The difference is when a person is in touch with the Lord. How may the sea become calm for us, you may ask? Jonah does not offer an easy suggestion. What is it, Brother Amos, that stopped the storm? Jonah was thrown overboard. The man who a few days ago despised the heathen now says, I'll give my life for you to live. I believe the heart change began in the boat. Sister Ross, I don't believe the whale was was anything other than to save Jonah's life and to tell him, you're not a lost cause. 
And I don't know what the Lord, Sister Laura, told Jonah in the well. We don't know. There was three days of praying. And I know that when I pray and I seek God, that I hear the voice of God. I don't know what the Lord had to tell Jonah. I do believe the Lord had to pump Jonah a little bit back up because you almost killed a whole bunch of people. God, you can't use me. Maybe that's how his prayer started. In the way. God, you can't use me. Send somebody else. Do you know what the Bible actually tells us? That our callings are without repentance. In other words, that if we'll get right with God, God will say, okay, here's what I called you to do. Go do it. And so Jonah gets thrown overboard. I believe the reason for the whale is still Jonah's not ready to go to Nineveh. Jonah has got to start believing in himself again and believing in the God that he serves again. And so the Lord has to show him, I just saved your life when you tried to end it. It shows us that God makes him a new man. I know he backs a little bit later, but then he comes out right in the end. Okay? So don't get so focused on the end. Again, you're missing what the whole point of this story. God has no other method for stealing seas than what Jonah did. I must sacrifice myself. You see, when I was in Hillside Christian Academy, I had to read a book. And in that book, it was about Livingston or Livingstone. And when he wanted to steal the tempest and the storm of Africa, he didn't say, I'll pray for you from America. He allowed himself to be thrown overboard. And that's the price that you and I have to pay. For real service. You say, well, where's that in the Bible? Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, the word says. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. I can't be fruitful to God until I die myself. We have to get to the place that we say, Lord, whatever you have to do, I want to be saved and I want to be used by you. I want my friends to be saved. I want my enemies to be saved. It's not about my convenience. It's not about my wish list. But it's about God and His will being done in my life. So I say this, and I'm, I'm closing tonight. That if we will do this, and if we will stop running from God, and if we will turn and walk with him, you'll find that Nineveh is not a city of restlessness and wretchedness. But you will find it is a city that's having revival and gets in fellowship with God. And in the blessed experience of that peace that passes all understanding, you'll find that there is satisfaction in your life again. Which way are you traveling? Are you on your way to Nineveh? Or are you on your way to Tarshish? I plan to preach this a whole nother way tonight. The other notes I thought sounded a whole lot better. But I'm going to tell you tonight what the word of God is for us. That if we will open our hand. See, too many of us are trying not to lose stuff. I got something in my hand, Brother Amos, I don't need to lose. All right? I don't need to lose it. On this flash drive is every sermon I've ever preached. On this flash drive holds all kinds of letters that I send. On this flash drive has all the music that I use on the radio broadcast. I know that sounds hard to believe. But if you don't believe it, ask Brother Justin. When this thing crashes, I go crying for help. Because almost my life would revolve around this thing because everything I do every day, I go to this at some point and I say I need it. But if I stay like this, if somebody wants to bless me, I can't receive it if I'm trying to hold on to everything that I own. But can I tell you something? When I open my hand, I don't have to lose what I've got to get something else. We get negative and we think if I open my hand, I'm going to drop it. And when I drop it, I'm going to lose it. And I'll never get it back again. God's not asking you to open your hand so He can take everything you've got. God's saying open your hand so I can give you something else. God's not trying to steal from you and to hurt you. 
But let me tell you something. If I try to hold on to this with everything that I got, you know what the word says? Something's going to come and it's going to knock it away and I'll never get it back again. If I don't get this in my spirit. I had to get to this place in pastoring. People come and people go. I had to get to that place in pastoring because it will keep you up at night. And it'll make you worry about stuff that's not God's will. And I'm going to tell you in your life, people come and people go. And sometimes you cry when they go and sometimes you don't. Those people on the boat, they probably missed old Jonah. But at some point they were thankful that he wasn't on that boat anymore. Especially when they pulled back up and that wife was waiting on the edge. And they think, I might not have saw her again. Had an eye not gave his life. You sit there and say, well, what are you saying tonight? I'm saying there's already somebody that's gave his life for you. And he says, unless you become like me. We sing it to be like Jesus. Do we mean it? He gave his life. He said, he said, I'm going to give you everything. Even looks to Peter and he says, I got some keys that I need to give you so you can unlock some doors for people so they can have access to stuff that everybody hadn't had access to. But you know what? For them to receive those keys, Jesus had to die. Peter couldn't use the keys while Jesus was walking. Peter didn't realize that. But on the day of Pentecost, he begins to understand this is just one of the keys. I wonder, Brother Justin, when it dawns on him. Is he in Cornelius' living room when the Holy Ghost falls and all of a sudden it... That's what Jesus is talking about. There's some Gentiles that just got the Holy Ghost. They've never had it before. And God used me. The man that was weeping sorrowfully because I said I didn't even know the man and I, I denied him three times. I didn't deserve it. But God used me. I'm preaching to Peters and other people in this room tonight that say, God can't use me. And I'm telling you, if you make yourself available to God, God will. Because Jesus told His disciples, greater things than these shall you do. I know y'all have seen it on Mitchell Street, but I haven't seen the dead come back to life. I love the story, but I want to see it. I have seen... A deaf ear opened. I have seen a blind eye open. I have seen some things, but I haven't seen everything. And if he said greater things, what is it that I'm not even mentioning tonight that God's sitting in heaven saying, if you would just say, I can use you. If you would just be confident in your faith. If you would just begin to proclaim things. I can open up the windows of heaven and amaze you. I can do exceeding abundantly above according to the power that works The saddest part about the story is Jonah refused and he had to go through storms in his life. I don't know what all Jonah said when he preached that day, but it was a powerful message, whatever it was, because every last one of those sinners fell on their face and they began to repent. Now here's the deal. The Lord still had some work to do on Jonah, even though some souls were saved. He got mad. He got mad. Thankfully, it all worked out in the end, and the Lord straightened Jonah out. I'm going to tell you, folks, we, we get so discouraged when people are up and down, but yet when I read about the prophets in the Scripture, they were up and down too. Your emotions can sometimes start overwhelming you. And if you're not careful, you'll start beating yourself up because your emotions are out of whack. Hear me right now. we got to submit ourselves to God's will and say, you know what? Sometimes it feels good and sometimes it don't. Jesus, did it feel good when the nails went through your hands? Paul, how did it feel when they had the whips and they were beating you? Stephen, how did it feel when the rocks were hitting you? But you looked up and you saw Jesus. And here I sit in an air-conditioned building in a padded chair (laughs) and I say oh it's just too hard to live for God oh God help us to see you'll use us if 
if we'll be willing to go to Nineveh. Stand with me tonight. What is it God's calling for you to do? Come on, what is it that God's trying to push for you to be involved in? Listen, let me say this before we ever before we give our altar call. Not everybody's called to children's ministry. I'm not preaching this because I need a whole bunch of volunteers for summer Bible camp. Okay? If I don't even fill that section up, I still feel like this message is going to be successful tonight because I feel it. It's resonating in your heart right now. Not everybody's called to children's ministry. Not everybody's called to sing on the platform. Not everybody's called to preach. But everybody is called. And we've got to find our calling to be happy. That's why people are miserable in their walk with God. Because they're not finding the satisfaction. Came a point in David's life he wasn't singing. And he wrote a pitiful song. But in that song there was restoration. And he said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. You, you shouldn't have to live for God with a frown on your face. And like it's the worst day that, and the worst thing that ever happened to you. When actually we used to sing it, Brother Chuck, Calvary is the best thing that ever happened. What God has done for me. It doesn't matter what i got to go through. It doesn't matter what I have to lose and what I have to sacrifice. Whatever it is, it's going to be worth it when I see Jesus. Would you lift your hands with me right now? Would you begin to receive this word in your heart and in your spirit? Come on, I want to hear you speaking to the Lord right now. Would you talk to Him on your own and just say, Lord, I receive your word. If you don't know what else to say, just say that over and over. Lord, I receive your word. I want this to be deposited into my spirit. I feel faith rising in this house today. Your fear is of rejection. We talked about fear today, but I want you to step in faith tonight and say, I'm going to hand that card without fear of rejection. Without fear that they're not going to do anything with it. Without the fear that they'll slam the door in my face. I'm going to just do what you've called me to do. Come on, lift your voice. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house right now. Come on, we spent time this morning praying through some things. But tonight it's time for us to hear the voice of God and what He's calling us to do. I can't sit in my room and, and say, God, I'm not qualified anymore. He delivered us. He's called us out of darkness into His light. Not to sit in the light and admire the view. It's to call people to come and join us. It's for us to reach out the window and, 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 and to speak to those that are maybe standing on the street that are hearing about what's happening in our life. I want to invite everybody that will. They're getting ready to sing tonight. I want to invite us to find a place to pray. If you don't know where God's wanting to use you, I want you to ask Him tonight. If you know, then you're stepping out and saying, God, I'm not going to Tarshish, a place of disobedience. I'm going to Nineveh, a place of obedience. I'm not going to run away from your presence, but I'm walking to you. I'm not going to run away, God, from the call upon my life, but I'm going to allow you to speak through me. I'm going to allow you to utilize the abilities that you've given me, God. Oh, yes. Come on, we need some prayer time in this building right now. He's preparing you to go to your Nineveh. Maybe this is the belly of the whale experience that you need for God to confirm His Word in your life and say, I'm calling you. I want you. I want you to work for me. Yes, God. I will go. Somebody that's struggling.